yesterday not the rumor I got this from the lifties that and they said if you're a betting man that I would come tomorrow which is today because the peak chair is more than likely gonna open now saying that I just got on the Creekside gondola and it's minus 17 and they just said with the wind chill at the top of the Creekside gondola it's minus 37 so is the peak chair gonna open then it's uh, maybe not. I might just go home. <laughs> Another hike to the peak, but this time with the Whistler ski bomb. Yeah, and the peak's running, and it's about to crack. We just got word from patrol. Yeah, and so symphony, and nobody's here. Oh, it's so slow in the cold, eh? Oh, yeah, so many tracks in here now. This is the official first wait of the year at the peak chair. January 14, 2020. And we just got the word that it is cracking. Just be patient. And we got it from your friend. <laughs> Dude. Officially the first ride on the peak chair. Even though they opened it and we were hiked up again. Like like dummies. <laughs> Not you guys. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> Woo -hoo -hoo! You gotta get in the edit again. Blast that shit! Oh! Wait out! Yeah! Woo -hoo -hoo! Woo! Oh yeah! Dude, right down here, Dave. Oh! Woo! Oh! Woo! Woo! Yeah, boys! Woo! Oh! <laughs> Jones Foot Locker.
This is the foot lock. <laughs> what about me? Oh, yeah, I know, I know I have my moments too. When I can get on your nerves. Uh -huh. But I want you to realize that taking care of a home, the kids, working every day, that can start to wear anybody down. So when you come home at night, maybe it's not lingerie and champagne like it used to be. But you know what's there? That same old heart, the one that beats for you, baby.
tree. Good thing I was a ballet skier. Oh, this is tough.
is one of the most important tricks you can learn on a snowboard. It's the most efficient way to get air and you'll learn to use it anytime your snowboard leaves the ground. Jumping from a flat base uses a lot of energy and doesn't get you very high. This is not an ollie. An ollie is where you use the flex of your board to spring your board into the air. The more flex you can get in your board, the higher your ollie will be. From a neutral stance, slide your board underneath you until you're balancing with your hips above your tail. In this position, your board will be bending and lifting off the ground in a tail press position. Pop up off your tail, bringing your board into the air, and absorb your landing evenly on both feet. Try the same movement but faster. This is an ollie. If you start with a tiny bit of weight over your front foot, it will help to give you more ability to slide your board underneath you to the tail. This allows you to get more flex from the tail of your board and ollie higher. Most riders actually find it easier to do an ollie while riding. When you first learn ollies, you don't have to think too much about putting weight on your front foot. It kind of just happens naturally. However, as you want to get higher, try this technique out. Just as you're about to ollie, apply a subtle bit of weight to your front foot, then slide your board underneath you, loading your tail and spring the ollie from the ground. This should help you get more flex into the tail of your board to ollie higher from the ground. Challenge the timing of your ollies by using a snowball, stick or any object. As you're free riding, you'll use ollies everywhere. You can ollie off every little feature or bump in the snow and every side hit you find. In the terrain park, the knuckles of park jumps are a great place to ollie off. With a fair amount of speed, ollie from the flat deck into the landing transition of the jump. The roll of the knuckle gives you a lot of extra height and hang time, which looks and feels great. If you can bring your ollies to the actual park jumps, then you'll be able to get a lot more height off the jump than you can with just popping. The timing of your ollies at this stage is very refined, and you often won't even notice the ollie. However, this is the method all advanced riders are using to spring their boards from the ground. On a flat box, you may be able to just ride on, however it'll look more stylish with a small ollie into it. And as you start stepping it up in the park, there are many bigger features where you'll need to use an ollie on your approach. Ollies are one of the most common and important tricks in snowboarding. You're riding with Nev Lapwood from Snowboard Addiction. Our goal is to improve your riding. Hello. So I had a request about my backcountry gear, which I don't really know much about. So I'm just going to check the specs on my phone. So I got the G3 senders right here. Those are replaced from my empires. And these ones are stiffer and they're longer. These are 181 by 112 underfoot and 139 on the tip and 127 on the tail. There's a bit of camber in here. And, but mostly rocker, and these are stiff. These suckers are stiff, so they really make you ski forward. It says, dropping in, dream of big mountains and backcountry free ride missions, then the sender is your ride. Okay, so what I found personally was they're, um, they push you forward, so like aggressive ski. Like these are an aggressive ski. So the ones that these replaced the empires that I had last year um, were a full rocker and you could like, you know, lazy back, did the lazy boy in the back seat. And these ones, no chance. Um, stiff, starting to like them. I've only skied on them um, like, just I've skied on them four times now, I think. Yeah, four, four different days. Yeah, and I've already beaten them up. Like I've got a course shot already, but I can fix them so anyway so that's that's the skis they're longer 
and yeah, they're, they ski more like my Black Crows, which are a lot stiffer than all the other mushy vocals I'm skiing on. Now, the bindings are just the G3, I don't know, they were on my other skis, let's see. These are G3 bindings. Oh, so these are the G3 Ion 12s. And these were on my Empires, so they just moved them over onto here. I did have a couple issues with these. They... They warrantied them, no problem. One of these magnetic little latches stopped working, and I think the pins were bending or something. Anyways, they just, they were, they're awesome. They just warrantied them. But yeah, they're light. These skis are, with these bindings are really light. Let's see. What does it say? The most intuitive, reliable, and powerful lightweight Turing binding, period. Okay, sure. <laughs> I really don't know much about them. So I know they work. I know you open them up, you put your feet in. Ooh, I'm starting to get better at this binding thing here. Ooh, you like yeah! Those ones? You like those ones? You go down, you ski around, and you're touring, you pull them up all the way. And I can feel that it's the position when you're climbing up um yeah it's not very much to them uh easy to turn the heel piece right here um then when you, you know when you step on your boot they they lock in one thing i learned the hard way watch this you do you want a glove on when you do this yeah i don't even want to do it where's a glove <laughs> All right, so you're out there and you want to turn your bindings back, put a glove on. This sucker's going to go. Watch this. <laughs> and you don't want to get your hands stuck in here. It ain't, it's not a whole pile of fun. I've ha <laughs> I did it. All right, so. So for the skins, okay. those skins are just um, these G3 Alpinists. They are on my, as these are, skis are longer by Six centimeters, I think. Or you were. I was struggling a lot. You can just fix them. Uh, you can wax them and stuff, right? Because I'm really light, I might need the extra. Oh, the extra the, sticky ones. There's the extra yeah. grip version. Yeah, they don't go downhill well, but they go uphill good. But again, because I'm light, that might not be a factor. Yeah. It might just give me the help I need. But yeah, it's all right for me. It's okay. Um, I don't know much about these. Alpinist, but
dropping in 10. Five, four, three, two, one, dropping. I just checked on their website and if you go on the G3 website, they have a they've done all the research. They can tell you why to buy them. I just know that they, uh, they're they decent. I can climb up with them. Um, yeah, they stick. These are three years old now. And they are on their... Heck, they're three years old and they are on their third pair of skis. Because they started off on my Vocal 1s. Went to my G3 Empires. And now they're on the G3 Senders. So... They've got some longevity. I don't actually even know how long they're supposed to last. And the last part of the gear is the same. G3 again. I don't know anything about these poles except you can make them longer or shorter. They've got some markings on here. There's some markings on here for your depth. Or, you know, like you can pull them apart if you're a tall guy. Short, short person. And... Yeah, so when you're skiing and you're side hilling, you can extend it or lower it. I don't usually bother. And it's got a little grip here for your hand, you know, so you can have different levels. You can move this up and down. And then I have my, my selfie ski here. So if I want to, like, shoot myself. throw the GoPro on here it's not, this thing doesn't weigh anything so I don't even bother taking it off and that's it so yeah I'm kind of like g3'd out because so the story in Squamish escape route and they're in Whistler as well but uh, they sell a lot of g3 stuff so I just kind of like I just went with it and it's been working um, yeah like I said the bindings just wait until the end of the year and yeah they're fine so that's my backcountry stuff. Um, that's it. <laughs> that's all I got on this one. You know, this stuff that comes between your skins when you buy them? Summer storage. <laughs> Don't take it out in the wood. Don't take it out with you. You'll just lose them. A little wind comes by and like, gone. Don't eat it.
there's a lot of people that know who I am just because of where I lived. But I didn't realize it when I was little. Living on the mountain just was what it was, and the kind of ironic thing about it is I'd go to friends' houses who had super fancy houses and all the toys in the world, and I'd be like, oh, I don't have that. You know, it's dumb. I lived on the mountain. I had something you couldn't buy. In 1978, my parents moved up there because there was the Tony Siler ski camps, and they needed someone up there to do different things from starting the lifts, just for security, making sure that people got down off the mountain at the end of the day. And so my parents lived up there and got pregnant, and then they took me to the top of the mountain when I was three days old. Growing up in the mountain didn't seem like a different childhood. You assume that what your life is like is normal. But looking back now, it's definitely a privilege to be able to grow up there. It would either be my mom or my dad that would head out in the mornings to go like start the lifts and stuff. But I don't really feel like we had necessarily a set routine. I think there was more of a freedom up there in the sense because where are you gonna go? You know, that's, that's where life is, is up there. My mom and I would always do top to bottoms. So we'd start at the roundhouse and then we'd go down Pony Trail, Orange Peel, and then go do Dave Murray down to the valley and then come back up. That's still a run that I will do as a family. I mean, the mountains are, are the mountains over time, but the way the lifts run now is completely different. When my parents were up there, I believe the gondola, they used to have to start from the top. It was kind of that old school way of things were done, right? I mean, you used to sit on chairlifts for ages, and on those stormy days, you'd be freezing and the hard, like, wooden chairlift seats. But now, lift access has changed so much. You just move through it so quickly, and then all of a sudden, you're up at the top. It's kind of incredible. People come off the top of the peak chair and look out and see that view of Black Tusk. I mean, I can look at that over and over again, and I'm still blown away. And then being able to ski down that mountain and get to the bottom, there's a way to get down. Like, you don't have to be able to ski a Black Diamond to access that. They get that feeling in their, like, deep in their soul of just that freedom and that lightness. It's, it's really cool to see people experience that. The ease of being able to get around to different places just from where they place lifts and where you can get to is kind of giving an opportunity to explore more of the mountain. When I first saw the towers going up for the peak to peak, I was like, what are they doing? And now that it's there, it's awesome to be able to have that ability to jump from mountain to mountain or your friends over on Whistler, you're like, cool, I'll be there in 15 minutes. You can just get on the peak to peak and cut across. There's something cool about that. You know, after we moved off the mountain, my dad had lived there for so long, they let us stay up and then at the end of the day do the sweep with patrol. There's something about skiing down the mountain when it's getting dark. The sun's going down and there's just this like beautiful orangey glow. You get that feeling kind of inside your chest and inside your
there's a lot of people that know who I am just because of where I lived. But I didn't realize it when I was little. Living on the mountain just was what it was, and the kind of ironic thing about it is I'd go to friends' houses who had super fancy houses and all the toys in the world, and I'd be like, oh, I don't have that. You know, it's dumb. I lived on the mountain. I had something you couldn't buy. In 1978, my parents moved up there because there was the Tony Siler ski camps, and they needed someone up there to do different things from starting the lifts, just for security, making sure that people got down off the mountain at the end of the day. And so my parents lived up there and got pregnant, and then they took me to the top of the mountain when I was three days old. Growing up in the mountain didn't seem like a different childhood. You assume that what your life is like is normal. But looking back now, it's definitely a privilege to be able to grow up there. It would either be my mom or my dad that would head out in the mornings to go like start the lifts and stuff. But I don't really be up there in the sense because where are you gonna go? You know, that's that's where life is, is that we'd start at the roundhouse and then we'd go down Pony Trail, Orange Peel, and then go do Dave Murray down to the valley and then come back up. That's still a run that I will do as a family. I mean, the mountains are, are the mountains. You know, the runs are still the same, the trees are still the same, things shift over time. But the way the lifts run now is completely different. When my parents were up there, I believe the gondola based have to start from the top. It was kind of that old school way of things were done, right? I mean, you used to sit on chairlifts for ages, and on those stormy days, you'd be freezing and the hard, like, wooden chairlift seats. But now, lift access has changed so much. You just move through it so quickly, and then all of a sudden, you're up at the top. It's kind of incredible. People come off the top of the peach. They're just in complete awe. I mean, I can look at that over and over again, and I'm still blown away. And then being able to ski down that mountain and get to the bottom, there's a way to get down. Like, you don't have to be able to ski a black diamond to access that. They get that feeling, and they're like, it's. It's really cool to see people experience that. The ease of being able to get around to different places just from where they place lifts and where you can get to is kind of giving an opportunity to explore more of the mountain. When I first saw the towers going up for the peak to peak, I was like, what? ability to jump from mountain to mountain or your friends over on Whistler, you're like, cool, I'll be there in 15 minutes. You can just get on the peak to peak and cut across. There's something cool about that. You know, after we moved off the mountain, my dad had lived there for so long, they let us stay up and then at the end of the day do the sweep with patrol. There's something about skiing down the mountain when it's getting dark, beautiful, orangey glow. You get that feeling kind of inside your chest and inside your...
of the sheer beauty of that brightness of that alpen glow. All of a sudden it ends and there's that like deep dark kind of blue that sets in. And it's something you just sit there and watch for hours, but it fades quickly, <laughs> making it extra special. It's cool being able to bring the kids up on the mountain because it gives kind of this like refreshed perspective of the mountain again. I mean, their view is different just because their home is their home and that was my home. And home to me is somewhere that when you come back to that place, you feel comfortable and you feel at ease. You feel that feeling inside your heart return. And for a lot of people, that is the mountains. So the sheer beauty of that brightness of that alpen glow. All of a sudden it ends and there's that like deep dark kind of blue that sets in. And it's something you just sit there and watch for hours, but it fades quickly, <laughs> making it extra special. It's cool being able to bring the kids up on the mountain because it gives kind of this like refreshed perspective of the mountain again. I mean, their view is different just because their home is their home and that was my home. And home to me is somewhere that when you come back to that place, you feel comfortable and you feel at ease. You feel that feeling inside your heart return. And for a lot of people, that is the mountains. Now that the party is jumping, with the face kicked in and the fakers all on them, 
Give DeHine credit for that. That's why it's called Ritz Carlson. He's the first one to hit it. Was it a sledder jump originally, or did the snowboarder hit it first? Sledder. Sledder. Ritz Carlson. And he broke his back. <laughs> wow. Oh my god, dude. Not moving. I've looked at that thing every time I rode by it this year. Thought about it before I went to bed and woke up with that knuckle in my head. Yeah. <laughs> that might be a hundred, man. I think it's 100. Alright, let's make it look like we really worked hard. <laughs> Alright, speed test one, you guys ready? I need to run speed, it's just so scary. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, is he actually going this fast? <laughs> Drop! That got me so fired up. I'm just like, holy smokes, like, here we go. Okay, thank you. Is everybody ready down there? Go! Yeah. 
that was fun. But the kind was so good, man. That really was. Yeah. Was good call. It was way above and beyond what I expected, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, that was intense. All right, let's do it again. Yeah, it was cool watching you guys hit for him. I'm stoked you guys got to hit it. I'm stoked too, yeah, it was really fun. Huh. Yeah. But yeah, I love Forum, man. I have nothing but fond memories of that jump. Forum stepped down again. I don't think the nervousness ever goes away. You're always scared. Interesting here, eh? Son of a bitch! <laughs> <laughs> Filming. Yeah. I told you we we're loosey goosey. Yeah. I don't like, think you really? believe me. No, I did. <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. definitely a different breed. Yeah. yeah. We are, but we're not really. Like the fact that we can hit the same jump on yeah. the same day. Yeah. We're not that different. Well, we're all chasing that same feeling. Yeah, it's cool. actually best day of my this year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. mine too. No, yeah, like hands yeah. down, yeah. Totally. Yeah. easily sure. best yeah. day for I sure. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Good morning guys, it is currently 5 a.m. I don't know if that's in focus, but anyways, me and Brennan here. As, as known as the platy daddy um we are on our way to whistler we're gonna go ride some sleds today uh it's supposed to be somewhat nice out and some fresh snow so we're pretty excited it's gonna be a good day we got some bros going up um meet a bunch of people up in squamish road tripping up get to whistler go have some fun what do you have to say bren not much, you know, it's the Platty Daddy here. We're gonna be opening up the vlog today for the peeps, uh, you know. Fuck. Keep rolling, buddy. Keep rolling. Uh, set our bars too high and then uh, hope for the best, I guess. Yeah, our, our hopes aren't too high, so we won't be thoroughly disappointed when we get up there and there isn't much snow. We have no idea what the conditions are gonna be like. Um, what we do know is that we have some epic slow motion, we have some cool cameras, we have some fucking awesome riders, and we're just there to have a good time and do our thing. So maybe we'll just roll the squam and we will meet you guys up there. Chevron. Um, I just remembered that in the video the other day of me putting my wrap on, I burnt the shit out of my intake. 
And so I was totally kidding about running an open intake. I am not doing it. Uh, so we have to come up with a solution for that. Not too sure what we're gonna do yet, but that's the situation right now. There goes the boys. Wherever Jer is, where Jer, where you at, boy? Oh yeah. Um, yeah, we're gonna grab some Chevron here. We're also gonna grab some Thames. We're starving. Look at everybody else got the same idea. Can these fucking guys work. Yeah, all right. Don't people. Don't people work these days? Frick. Getting gas and some other things there, Jared. Let's see you up there, bud. So we're at Steve's at No Limits Motorsports. It's obviously co closed. But yeah, we're just waiting. That, that's that was the plan we came up with cuz I'm an idiot and I burnt it up Fucking dum dum salad over there It's gonna be sunny today Yeah, I don't know. you're wasting our fucking time buddy. Yeah, it's gonna be bluebird. It's gonna be sick up there Yeah, I wish we were up there already. Yep. If somebody didn't burn their intake We would have been up there with the boys Oh, well. boys, boys are gonna get all the fresh tracks before we even get up there. Mother F. Can you do? Gonna move the rig for me. Should say us. Get this place open, get an intake, get out to the mountain. That's the plan. It's on sleds, on sleds, on sleds, on sleds, on sleds. On sleds, on sleds, on sleds, on sleds, on sleds. Did you get the sleds in the video? Got a couple sleds in the video. Riding area, it's kind of like tree riding. Uh, if you wanted to go big mountain or whatever, that's kind of brand new one area. But yeah, Sprout's sick. It's super good riding area. A lot of people love it. Brennan seems to really like it for some reason. It's the only fucking place this guy rides. I like it because the boys like it.
Get it out. Hey guys, so me and Brennan found the good stuff. Uh, we found a little hole. Uh, it's up top, it's pretty wind blowing, so the snow's not that great up there. But <clears throat> down it, down in the holes, you can definitely find some good snow. So we shot a. We got a couple shots, and I think we're gonna go back and find the crew. What do you think? Even if I gave it to him, they would not know how to stir. They would not know how to chef. Watch me cut, cut. Watch this fight. You might see me in a look, but shouldn't known I was coming for your spot, spot. Should've known I was at it to the top so I was on a plane when I realized that I'm what They all sound the same, they all sound nothing like us Young, young whoosh, I'm a guy with the bus Young, young whoosh, you might have to catch the bus Ay. Young, young whoosh, let me speak on the real real quick Man, I'm hungry so I set me up a meal real quick I see money, let me go and make a meal real quick Found a baddie, made a mind, but she a real chill chick Group, 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 he's wondering if they the one She say she love me, man, that shit just made me run This is easy, man, I made this song in one day They say, Gucci, Gucci, you gon' blow up one day That's cause I'm the one with the sauce Chef Legacy with the pans and the pots they want the recipe, ain't that a first Even if I gave it to them, they would not know how to stir They would not know how to stir it, stir it, stir it, stir it, stir it, stir it, stir it Stir it, stir it, stir it, stir it, stir it They would not know how to stir it, stir it, stir it, stir it, stir it Even if I gave it to them, they would not know how to stir it They would not know how to stir it guys so me and Brandon are on our way home now done riding for the day it wasn't great but it wasn't bad either uh, snow was really wind blowing up top like I said and then if you got it down into a honey hole it was good uh, Brandon what do you think about today Sorry. yeah it was it was pretty all right bit of a drive for mediocre snow yeah yeah, from like our house to Whistler, like where our riding zones is like two hours. So, um, but yeah, it was nice to get out. Actually, it was nice to get out with the Alcas and try those out on like the groomers and get into some whoops. And then also into a little bit of uh, powder and stuff like that. And all around so far, I'm loving them. They're working really well. And uh, also my camera box is awesome, works great, super easy to get the camera out, do my thing. Um, eh. That's it for this time, we'll catch you guys later. Say bye Bren. Bye guys. Bye guys.
Frontside board slide, or simply just a front board, is when you jump onto a box or rail while it's in front of you, spinning the board so the nose goes over the feature, landing perpendicular to the bar with it centered between the bindings. We'll start with a frontside board slide to fakie. Spin onto the balance bar the same way you would for a backside 180, making sure you let your head turn with your shoulders as you jump. When you spin 90 degrees to get into the frontside board slide, the board will want to continue to spin bringing you off fakie. Once you start this rotation, it's hard to stop, especially if you're using the slick base jib board. It's going to want to keep spinning, just like a snowboard would on a box or rail. For good style, try to keep your board 90 degrees to the balance bar the whole time you're on it. To keep it there, let your upper body continue to rotate in the direction you jumped on while trying to keep your board perpendicular to the balance bar. You might notice you end up going into a position similar to a frontside shifty, twisting through your core. When you pop off, use your core muscles to bring your board back in line with your shoulders, landing fakie. To come out of the front board forward in the same position you jumped on, you need to use counter rotation. You still want to land with the board 90 degrees, balance bar in the middle of your board, but your body will be in a slightly different position. Imagine yourself snowboarding. When you jump onto the balance bar, you want to turn your board using the same movements you would for a backside shifty. Spinning your board backside while your upper body rotates in the opposite direction, twisting your body through your core. Land twisted and hold that position so your board is across the balance bar and your head is looking down the rail. I think about reaching for the nose of my board with my back hand to keep the tension going through my body. Try to hold this position the whole time you're on the balance bar. You're going to need it when you jump off. If you can't get the board completely 90 degrees, try rotating in the opposite direction towards the tail before you jump on to allow you to counter rotate even more. When you jump off, you're going to use the tension in your core, throwing your arms back towards your tail to bring your board back to the position you started in. Practice both of these techniques and fine tune them until they feel exactly like how you'd like to do front boards on snow. I'm Duncan Mainland from Snowboard Addiction. Our goal is to improve your riding.
my name is Michael Horst. I'm the Heli Ski Operations Manager at Tyax Lodge in Heli Ski. At Tyax, we have an incredible and experienced group working as a team in the field. Two guides, one pilot, one helicopter, ten guests or less. We have, we have only four helicopters and up to 40 skiers out skiing in a day. We go and we find the best snow and the best skiing and we continue skiing until everyone is happy and satiated with powder skiing before they return home on Friday. One of the benefits of coming to Tyax is our close proximity to Vancouver. This means that the time that you spend on your heli ski holiday are actually spent here at the lodge and skiing and not with spending a lot of time transferring. The great thing about the Chilcotins, which is where this area is located, is that it's a drier snowpack on the coast here. So we get unbelievable snow conditions, dry, light, deep, and a lot of great skiing for people that come here. People do come to Tyax, they do have the ability to choose the length of their ski holiday. You can go as short as three days and as long as seven days. And that's our signature program. We've also got a more exclusive platinum program, which we offer private chalet, which includes a private massage therapist, a private chef, and a concierge. My name is Brooklyn. I'm a massage therapist here at Tyax Lodge and Heli Skiing. We offer our clients uh, anywhere between a 25 minute, 50 minute, or an 80 minute treatment of either a relaxation massage or a sports massage, so including deep tissue, um, shiatsu, we use different elements from different modalities. And yeah, every massage is catered to the guests. For our operation, to ensure that our guests have an amazing experience, stay very safe, the guides meet every morning at 6 a.m., sometimes even earlier. We go through every single run in the million acres that we have and talk about whether it should be open or closed for the day as a team. And we're choosing runs that we believe are going to be a lot of fun and safe for our guests to ski. people are out skiing. However, when they are not, we do have a full range of activities here at the lodge. Uh, we always have an ice hockey rink. I'm the executive chef here at Tyx Lodge and Heli Skiing. I'm originally from Montreal and my love for cooking has taken me abroad on a few occasions. Here at Tyx, I manage a team of 10 cooks, all of which are very passionate and they all contribute in their own unique way to our guest experience here at Tyx. We serve our food in a luxurious setting among the wilderness. Me and my team
number forward to meeting you. Our groups are single groups with one helicopter dedicated to their own group. We have an unlimited vertical package, so we and a vertical guarantee. For a seven-day group, we guarantee 30,500 meters. So 
I've been living in the Sea to Sky corridor in Whistler for the last 25 years, and I've flown sort of in this region, and I think it's one of the most beautiful areas that uh, to fly in, just from a, an aesthetically, I mean, beautiful mountains challenge, and uh, you know, I think that the Tyax operation here is, is world class and top notch.
Hey, this is Gabe Zaquera at, uh, oh my God, I messed up right there. Hey, this is Gabe Zaquera here with Snore Addiction. I'm 10 years old. Here's a tutorial on switchback threes. Before you learn a switchback three, you have to be able to do front ones for the landing and switch back ones for the takeoff. And then those are, you combine those two and that's a switch back three. I'm, here, I'm gonna do a switch back one here. So I have the lineup for the switch back three for later. Coming in on my toe, the heel edge pops. Here I'm gonna do a front one for the switch back three landing later. Yeah, I'm gonna do Most people find switch backside hardest. They just need to practice it over and over and over. I'm gonna be doing switch back threes. I'm gonna be focusing on the lineup, heel edge, toe edge, snap, and the landing. Here I'm coming in my heel edge, toe edge, pop, snap. I'm looking at these jumps, visualizing them. So I have a good lineup because these are bigger takeoffs. You don't want to start your car early, otherwise you're gonna drip, you're gonna go sideways and knuckle. So I'm trying to go straight off the takeoff, snap later, and then land perfect. Sweet spot. All those three jumps felt good. The takeoffs felt nice, straight. The landings felt awesome. And Gage Aquera, with Snow Addiction, our goal is to improve your riding. Yeah, I'm good, dude. This looks like it's gonna slide. Okay, we're gonna watch you go. I'll just take this little bit of pace because it's probably gonna slide. Yep, okay, we're just gonna watch you go. So, his first time down the Hobbit track. I don't think there's gonna be much turn going on. Sit. And then just a straight line. Woo! Yeah! Yeah! So we just skied down the hover tracks. That was really not scary. Go Come this here. way. I think we gotta go down here. Oh, I didn't win. I, I didn't win. Look here. Get me. Oh. So this is where we're going right here. Let's just have a look. And Take your pick, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just say pick your line and let's go.
Oh, that was worth the hike. Oh yeah, that was worth the hike right there. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Don't tell me that wasn't worth the hike. Awesome. Yeah, Sid. Sid, he's shaking his bank. Yeah, bro. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. Dude, that's adventures right there. Woo! Whoa. All right, it didn't take me eight minutes. Woo! Wow, that was good though. Deep as shit, man. Woo! Holy crap. Woo! And the snow sucks. Wow, that was brutal. Dropping to the high hole. Look at this shit coming at you.
are two different types of landings you're going to encounter, no matter how much or which way you spin. The open landing, and the blind landing. A frontside 180 has an open landing. Your body and board rotate 180 degrees, however your head can stay looking in the same direction throughout the entire trip. It's an open landing because you're looking into the same direction that you're riding. Open landings are very intuitive and snowboarders who are new to freestyle will not have to think about looking downhill as they land. However, with a backside 180, you want to land blind, looking either down at your feet, the knuckle of the jump, or back up the hill, with your body slightly counter-rotated and gripping the snow on your toe edge. A blind landing helps stop your spin momentum and prevents you from reverting. This technique is very important to master, however it's not intuitive and takes some practice to get the hang of. A frontside 360 also uses a blind landing, a front there is basically just a front side 180 with a switch back side 180 combined. So the landing uses the same technique of a switch back side 180. If you try to land a front side 360 looking back downhill, you'll most likely over rotate and either slip out or revert as you land. Back side 360s are like back ones combined with a switch front one. So you use an open landing like a front side 180. You land looking forwards in your direction of momentum with your body fairly aligned. Open landings can be stomped either on your toe or your heel edge. As you progress your spins and start learning larger rotations, you'll find that each spin alternates a blind landing then an open landing. Front side 180, open landing. Front side 360, blind landing. Frontside 540, open. Frontside 720, blind. It's the opposite for backside spins. Back one, blind. Back three, open. Back five, blind. Back seven, open. Learning these two different landing techniques will really help you progress your spins. If you're comfortable with the open landing of a front side 180, the feeling of landing a front five will be similar. The blind landing of a back side 180 is the exact same technique for stomping a back five. When practicing spins on the tramp training board, make sure to think about how you want to land your tricks and which edge are you landing with. Doing this will make it more realistic for when you take it to the snow. You're riding with Nev Lapwood from Snowboard Addiction. Our goal is to improve your riding. Oh. <sighs> Yay! Yay! We got an, I got another one! It. Okay, I'm just gonna go.
Adventures with Flowrider. Winter version. Okay, well, when Flowrider says it's wreck approved, mind you, he didn't say any of that this time. He just said, I need you to get a iPhone picture of me. So just trying to get over here still. <sighs> Motherfucker. Oh, I can't swear. Holy crap, Ola. How's that sound? All right. So, Ryder, what do you call this one?
I just love meeting these people from Hawaii. She was from Hawaii, that woman. Really? Yeah. Put some stickers up here, eh? Yeah. Sure remember to bring some next time. I got some bigger ones getting made. Do you qualify? I think so. What is this hike though? Last one's like this. Alright. Five bucks. All right, kid. What's this called? I didn't hear you. Zut, zut. As in, it's a zut, it's a zit, but a zut. Time we go somewhere with them, there's a double black sign. <laughs>
Catchy, isn't it? You know, I've come up there and people behind me started yelling at me. Yeah, because I wasn't going fast enough for them. Total. And I'm like, Woohoo! Sure. All right, and that's the way you do it. <laughs> What's this? Sorry? Diamond bowl. Diamond bowl. Yep. It looks wild.
I read about it. Oh, that's that one. Uh, that's really steep, right? And you gotta go over like this. Yeah, no. I know what he's talking about. I was I did it last year on the Shiro Juniors. Oh, there's a traverse. It's like this wide over the cliff. Oh yeah. Well, it wasn't that wide last year when I did it in March. You want to go? I done it. Yeah, do All right, let's go. It's pretty thin, dude. It's had a lot of uh, wind blowing up here. This ain't it, is it? I remember going farther over than this. Oh, well, maybe this is, you're right. Oh. There's only two lines down out of here, though, right?
right, good afternoon, everybody. This is Andrew with Whistler Live. I don't know if you can see this logo right here, but this logo means good things. Ladies and gentlemen, behind me, our good friends from Red Chair have stopped by the garage here at Whistler Live, and they're going to play a song for you all out there. How many of you would like to see Red Chair do a live stream with Whistler Live? Put your comments down below. Ladies and gentlemen, here's one song to make your day. Put your hands together for Red Chair. Down the street, real pull way down low. Ain't no sound with the sound of his feet. Machine gun ready to go. Are you ready? Hey, are you ready for this? Are you hanging on the edge of your seat? Out of the doorway, the bullets rip. Ain't into the sound of the beat. Ah, yeah. Another one bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. And another one gone, and another one gone. Another one bites the dust. Hey, I'm gonna get you to another one back to dust. Whistler Live. Coming down there, Ryder. I got my camera on you. Hey, either side's good, Tamer.
that side's a bit steeper there. Or? Yeah, not icy, hard pack. Look at you're the schluffinator. Okay, give give a schluffinator. Okay, the spot I remember Ryder was more in the trees. I think this had to be it. And no. We ain't at it all yet, though, you know. I, I'm kind of liking that line. Yeah, I don't know if I... Yeah. It's okay. Pretty freaking steep, though, ain't it? <laughs> Woo! Oh. Thanks, buddy.
Well, it's a sunny day and I'm waiting in line, not for powder, but to see if I can do a sub five minute peak to creek. We're gonna find out. Okay, well, we're on first chair. We wait, like I said, we waited for a groomer. <laughs> And it uh, looks decent actually, but yeah, we're, we're gonna go ahead creek to creek. All right, the time, the time starts when you get at the corner though. Not here. All right. So on your GoPro? Cause you're not on the run yet, right? Oh, the load, loading and doing loop is crazy. Yeah, for sure. All right. So, I start the time right at this corner. Because now you're on it. Oh, it's powder!
This is the tough part, the start gate, right? Once you drop in, you're just skiing. That breathing is gonna keep you going, right? Another day in the free ride club.
Oh man! Woo! Dude! Crazy! Oh. On your GoPro it says 6 minutes 35 seconds right by now. Yeah, but it was turned on. Yeah. Dude, you were ripping! <laughs> That was good. I like you came down. by me. I slowed down because I didn't know where to go. I was very careful to make sure you had half a run to yourself at least. Oh, I, I didn't by. care. It was yeah. fine. Yeah. Dude, that was wicked. Pretty conscious not to cut people off. Oh. He said my legs are destroyed. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> Z. Let's go. Back in the gondola. <laughs>
I've always heard that Whistler is the best, that it's amazing and it's the benchmark for so many reasons. And now I can hardly believe that I'm actually here. We're here. And now I've got three full days to ride both mountains and really just experience as much as I possibly can. I started my first morning before the sun came up. I signed up for Fresh Tracks breakfast, which means getting to the gondola at 7 a.m. with other skiers and riders who clearly understand the benefits of getting up that early, especially on a powder day. People go, like, and especially on a day like today. And then I smelled bacon. Bacon, when it starts falling off, that's how you know you don't need more. And finally, the moment I've been waiting for, it was time to ride. favorite places was the peak chair. It has this unique culture all on its own. Even the lineup is fun. Here goes one. Oh, and then money. Oh. <laughs> Everybody was so stoked to get to the top. And when I got there, I understood why. When you find a place this special, you want to share it with like-minded riders. So I joined a small snow school group and had four instant friends and lift line priority for the rest of the day. I mean, you kind of feel like a VIP. By lunchtime, I was starving, and that's when I discovered the famous pulled pork sandwich. Oh my goodness. We ended our day with a much needed refreshing drink and a plate of nachos big enough for the entire patio. I mean, you could see these things from space. Oh yeah, how does that go? Well, my buddy here has been skiing since day one. Conveniently, I forgot to pack a few things, so I headed to the village to see what I could find. They pretty much have something for everybody. And I mean everybody. With so many activities to choose from, I was very excited that I chose the snowmobile night trip. I admit I was a little nervous at first, but it didn't take long for my driving instincts to kick in. Snowmobiling in the dark to a mountaintop fondue. Yeah, that's up there with one of the coolest experiences ever. The next night, I somehow got talked into trying fire spinning. Yeah, then I found out that the fire spinner's outfits are actually flame resistant. It's not often that I'm jealous of head to toe sequins, but in this case, you could say I was very, very jealous. And of course, I had to check out the infamous local band, the Hair Farmers. Now I know why everyone says Whistler has nightlife dialed. It's got tons of entertainment and great food and more food, and even more food than that. After going Mach 10 for about three days, it was nice to trade in the Gore-Tex for a plush rope and just melt away in the hot tub. There's just so much to do here that it would take way more than one trip to really do it justice. House music, it's a spiritual thing. Spiritual thing. A body thing. A soul thing. A soul thing. A soul thing. A soul thing. Not everyone Let's do this.
What's up guys? Another beautiful powder day on Whistler. The winter is finally here! <laughs> and today's gonna be my first day trying out a career shaped snowboard. This is the T-Finder. It comes in two sizes, the 54 and 57. And it's got their signature white top sheet and red base. The profile on this is camber between the insert points and then you have a nice rockered out shovel nose and then a stunted kind of poppy tail to it. So you get a nice kick off of this tail. Centered base, poplar core, yeah, nice and responsive. Got a lot of energy out of it. Really fun in these trees. It's kind of taking that like surfboard inspired feel and trying to bring it to all places on the mountain. Andreas looks like a sick board. What is that? Oh man, this is the Karua Shapes Dart in a 156. It's their stunted cutout swallowtail shape. You buy it nice and short and it's really quick and nimble. So really good float in the front shovel. Powder and the, bomb. <laughs> and then the tree pukes snow on you. You know, we're getting full blown powder week here in Whistler. Uh, there's been snow day after day after day. And uh, the best thing about today is there's no lift lines, man. We did have that cool bit earlier where we were going down and a big powder bomb dropped right in front of you and it was just white out. It was just white out. It exploded. <laughs> going through like the trees. It was a winter blizzard. <laughs> oh, and how man. did this handle that where you can't even see really what's underneath you? Do you get a, how's the response? How's the feel of the board? It's so quick and nimble, man. I just sort of like set myself back on it. The whole tail sinks into the snow. The front end powers up and then you can really just slow yourself into whatever turn you want. So yeah, really easy to get this thing arcing around through tight areas. All right, so we're taking a little break in the trees. It's about halfway through the day. I've done about four or five laps on the tranny finder, and I really, really like this board. And it just Oh, okay. 
House Music. House Music. House Music.
things like edge to edge so easily once you get into that rhythm you barely have to put in any effort you just give it a little kick on the way out and then it's already trying to initiate the turn for you coming in the other side you see today we got some really deep parts of powder and some not so deep parts and this thing just destroys in all of it really good cruising through the trees on these different lines where sometimes we have to follow the lines through and it's got really good control through there and then other times just trying to bust new lines try to find new zones with the powder it's got such great float on that nose a big rocket out shovel that you don't really have to put in much effort to keep it afloat it's way more centered than riding the t-rice i don't have to put so much weight on my back foot it's all just uh nice and balanced nice and central everything feels way more zen and i had a chance to hit a few drops um, a few little side hits and jumps and it feels really stable on the takeoff it feels great on the landing Overall, like, I'm really, really impressed with this board. Andreas, dude, we've all seen you shredding on the dart so far. What's it like to be strapped into that thing? This thing accelerates super quick. Because it's got zero tail, it's really easy to lay back on it and get that front shovel to pop out of the snow. And you can make last minute harebrained decisions through the trees. <laughs> Which is perfect in these conditions. <laughs> There's a lot of last minute decisions looking at your line and that thing must be perfect for it. Yeah, man, it's so nimble and it stays above the snow super easy. So like you were saying, it pierces through those areas that are untouched and just really allows us to access wherever we wanna go. How does that rate compared to the other crew shapes boards? I think in the powder, this is the most fun I've had on a Karua Shapes. So this is definitely their more powder oriented board. It's got that swallow tail, you know, definitely wants to sink in the deeper snow, but it makes it really agile, super quick and turny. I just can't say enough about how much fun this board is. It's an amazing board for a day like today. So we just cruise over around the peak to peak to black home and then we just ride down to the cars. Am I right? Sure. Okay. All right, see you in a hot minute. All right, man, see you soon. Thanks for an awesome day of riding. Yeah, dog. <laughs> These are the boards they have to demo. Take it in. So Andreas, final thoughts on the dart. Dude, this thing was so much fun. Super agile, really quick turning, 
floated like a dream. <laughs>
notched out swallow tail in the back here really lets the tail of the board sink in the deeper snow so that that front shovel always planes out of the snow and you can really sink this thing in and push it in so that you can make those last minute changes in your turns. And Andreas, <laughs> I know you always try to see the best things in boards, but would you say this is your, one of your new favorite snowboards? Yeah, this is definitely one of my new favorite boards for the trees. It's so nimble, it's so quick, it's got so much agility. So yeah, can't not be feeling this snowboard, guys. Do you have anything uh, constructive to say about it? Constructive criticism? Uh, no, I mean, it's, it does exactly what it's designed for, you know? It's really good for carving, it's really good for powder. Obviously a board like this isn't amazing in Switch, but hey, I can make it work. And uh, there's still enough tail on it that you can still get some, you know, rebound out of that tail. You can still press off of it, so. Yeah, pretty impressed by this thing. Andreas approved. It's the seal of Andreas approval, yes. And yeah, my first day on the Trendy Finder, I was really impressed with the board and I guess career shapes overall, this being my introduction to them. Super playful board, floats like a dream, which is awesome today in those conditions we were doing. So definitely would recommend in powdery, fluffy, snowy trees. Yeah. But you've ridden both, and you said you prefer the dart in that terrain. Well, the Tranny Finder is definitely the more versatile board. You could ride this more all mountain. It would go everywhere easier, versus this guy here is a wicked board for specifically a powder day, and especially in the trees where you want With those quick, short tight tail. turns. Yeah. yeah. But this tail is pretty short, too. Yeah, it is you know, a stunted tail as well. It's got a nice little quick turning radius on it. You get a little bit more tail to land on in the Tranny Finder. Versus with this one, you give up some of the tail, but it makes it a little bit more agile. It makes it even more powder specific. And riding this switch, it did feel pretty good. Uh, notice when I had a bit too much pressure on my front foot riding switch, then the, it would kind of give out a little bit. So I think that's just something that I have to get used to as well. But obviously the nose being about twice as long as the tail, you are going to be giving up a little bit of switch. But the fact that it could do so well switch, I could land in powder switch. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, great you got overall some nice board. Spins on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's fun. All right, well, if you guys are interested in these boards or other crew shaped boards or a whole selection, um, I'm probably going to put up a little shot right now of all the boards they got here. Yeah, just come on down, 50 bucks to try them out, and then it gets taken off the price. First year you guys are doing it. Yeah. I'm super excited to make the most. Yeah, guys, come <laughs> on down to Comore Sports here on Main Street. Try out a demo. <laughs> try out a demo. They only cost 50 bucks. And uh, yeah, if you decide to buy the board afterwards, that price gets deducted from the overall cost. So it's a great way to test out a board, see if you like it, figure out which one's the best for you. Right, awesome. Well, thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Mr. Comor. And I'll see you guys in the next video. There's no Mr. Comor. What do you got there, Chris? Mmm, homemade banana bread. Mmm. Hey, it's awesome. You're, we're in the woods like this. You get a little bit of a rumbling in the tummy. Don't go to the Yon Mountain restaurants. Just bring some banana bread, you dum dum. <laughs>
Hello, I'm Alice and I'm going to be talking to you about Whistler today. Whistler is my home. I've called it home for a year and a couple of months now. It is one of my favourite places in the world, but I wish when I got here that someone had told me some of the things that I'm going to tell you. So here's a few things or a few tips for living in Whistler. Hands down, the most difficult thing is the housing situation. In the summer, finding accommodation is a lot easier, but in the winter, it can be really very tricky indeed. When I came here, I didn't have any accommodation whatsoever, and it was really very stressful. Me and my partner spent months living in a different place each month, and even around Christmas time, thinking that we might be homeless. We managed to make it work, but for a lot of people, they don't, and they end up going home. If this is you and you can't find accommodation in Whistler, remember there are so many amazing resort towns, places like Revelstoke, uh, Big White, also Banff. There's some incredible places around Whistler in BC and also elsewhere in Canada. You do not need to feel like you're stuck in Whistler and don't have an option other than staying here. Facebook is where I found most of my accommodation. If you go into Whistler housing crisis and then the year that you're looking to apply to come to Whistler, you can have a look on there for all the people who are posting their accommodation and also other people who are looking for it too. It's important to know that you probably will be sharing a room with another person, so be prepared for a bunk mate or two people in a room. Sometimes it can be more than this. I have heard of eight people in a room uh, paying 800 each. There are some slumlords in Whistler. You do have rights as a tenant though, and I can tell you more about that in another video. But just remember, getting accommodation can be tricky. So you'll save yourself so much hassle if you get it done beforehand. The places where you can look for accommodation are very, there's a few different spots. One of them is Craigslist, but you do just need to make sure that you are aware of any scams on Craigslist because every year someone always promises someone keys to a flat uh, when actually it isn't theirs or it was never existing in the first place. It's all about who you know, not necessarily what you know in Whistler. So really pull at any thread that you can. Most people are really happy to help out and in, when it comes to accommodation, you really need it. Once you've got the accommodation part down, the rest is a breeze. Finding a job is honestly easier than anywhere else I've been in the world. I would recommend looking at what you want from your season. So for example, if you want to ski a lot, then don't get a job where you're going to be working day shifts every day, six days a week. If you want to be skiing, you want a job where you're working night shifts, or you want a job where you get three days off. You do not need to just work for Whistler back home. When I first came to Whistler, that's what I thought was my only option. Uh, but actually, there's lots of other really amazing companies that you can work for when you're in Whistler. Getting a job is very easily done. <laughs> If you're struggling with accommodation or buying a ski pass, some jobs do offer this, but just be wary because if you do get that job and you're not enjoying it, then it might be trickier to leave because if you leave, you might lose your ski pass and no accommodation. If you work for the mountain, if you work for Whistler Blackcomb, you do get a ski pass. They also ask for holiday help over the winter, which means you do have to do a small amount of hours. So this year it's 50 hours. And just by working that small amount, you get a ski pass. You can pay for a ski pass outright, which is what I would recommend because it gives you a little bit more independence. It is around $1,182 and maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less, depending on when you buy. Um, and that gives you the independence really to be able to get whatever job you want. Making friends in Whistler. This is a tricky one because speaking from experience I know that sometimes locals can be a bit cold which you can kind of understand when you think about why that or where that comes from really. So you think that every year we get new people coming in, typically from Australia and England. They stay for two years and then they leave. Sometimes they're not worried about the environment they're living in and they just often are seen partying a lot or making the most of their season, but then not really making an effort to care about the place that they're living. Not only that, but also you get a lot of people that come and they're fantastic people and everyone loves to have them around and then they disappear again. So that's not really good for your heart, is it? It's kind of a bit, um, it's a bit much to keep seeing people and then saying goodbye to people again as well. So you can see where the frustration comes from. So sometimes it's a little bit tricky to get to know the locals, but you did not come to Canada to just make friends with people from back home. I've met some incredible people from England. I've met some of my best friends that I will be friends with forever. But also I've met...
Canadians and that's really important you want to make friends with people who live here because that is such a privilege it's such a privilege to get to know the people who live locally one way that you can make friends is by working as a volunteer maybe for organizations like WAG I did that here it stands for Whistler Animals Galore which is a charity that supports and shelters animals that have been abandoned or have been injured and they work on rehabilitating them and getting them into happy homes forever which is fantastic and it's a brilliant way to meet new people it's such a good topic of conversation and people are really interested another way you can make friends is by doing things like joining the library I know that that sounds ridiculous but it is honestly one of my favorite places in Whistler. They host games nights at the library sometimes which is so fun. They do free movie nights usually on a Tuesday and they also they do lots of events basically to help encourage you to get to know not only the surrounding area but also each other which is really lovely because it's necessary in a place like Whistler sometimes where it can get a little bit isolated. Facebook is a fantastic place to go to make friends. Facebook and Whistler is hugely used. There's a page on Facebook that's frequented by locals and visitors alike. It's called Whistler Winter. If it's the summertime it will be called Whistler Summer and then the year that you arrive and it's a fantastic resource to meet people, to share knowledge and also to learn a little bit more place is anyone around does anyone want to join me and usually they get a bunch of comments back from really lovely people also on Facebook they have the Whistler vegans page so if you're like me and you're a vegan and you want to meet some friends who are like-minded you can look on that page and there is a huge amount of support on that page for you and also for you to make friends. One thing that I did struggle with when I came to Whistler is the drinking culture. I'm not really much of a heavy drinker. One glass of wine will get me tiddly, so I would much rather hang out with friends over dinner or maybe have a games night. So I'd rather that's a good option. Getting around in Whistler is a challenge in itself. So when you're hoping to travel outside of Whistler, here's a few things you need to bet. Fantastic creatures in Whistler that quite simply wouldn't be there if the place was filled with humans. There are a few towns nearby Whistler. One of those is called Pemberton, that's away from Vancouver. And then there's one called Squamish, which is between Vancouver and Whistler. The first thing I would recommend is hitchhiking. Hitchhiking is fairly easy to do in Whistler and because people are only really going one direction or the other and there's only really one route between the two, uh, it's fairly easy to do that safely. Most people in Whistler that I've spoken to are wonderful and not to be feared, really. Obviously don't be an idiot, maybe don't get in the car. There's also a website called Pop A Ride like if you were to pop bubblegum and then a ride. It isn't a taxi service, it's quite simply locals who are going that way. So they're offering to see if anybody wants to come with them. So that could be you if you knew about that website, but most people don't until a little bit further into being in Whistler. It's a shame because it could make life so much easier. And it's a really good way of sharing resources. Um, it's better for the environment, it's also better for your wallet. If you're hoping to get a bus, there's a few different bus systems in Whistler. Within Whistler itself, you've got the BC Transit buses. So it's definitely worth when you arrive looking at getting a bus pass, especially if you're living a little bit further out. You can get the 99 to take you to Pemberton. Lots of people do that commute every day. You can do epic rides, that's one option. And that I know at the moment does a return journey to and from Vancouver for uh, 35-ish dollars, so just have a look on the internet for that one. At the moment there's also Skylinks buses and Wilson buses too. If you're coming from abroad, it's a really good idea if you're thinking about buying a car to get around to bring your insurance documents and also proof that you haven't had any collisions in 10 years. If you can do that, you get significantly discounted rates when it comes to buying your insurance in Canada. Otherwise, you get caught out later down the line when they say that you need extra documentation you don't have um, and then you have to follow it up from here, which is not fun. Uh, trust me, I've been there. Remember, caring is sharing, so if you have a ride and you have some spots in your car, why not offer other people a lift? Because it'll be making your journey if you were on the receiving end of that, and also will probably make your journey a bit more interesting because you get to know some people. I know at this point you've probably up to your eyeballs and documentation that you've had to do in order to get a visa or in whatever situation you are in right now, but one thing... <laughs>
How does a photographer get turned into a cat driver, get turned into a chef? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. In the mid-90s, well before digital photography, I got given a film camera and I thought, oh, photographing the night sky, that, that sounds like a lot of fun. I asked my science teacher, I want to photograph the stars, how do I do that? He said, point it straight south and uh, lock the shutter and see what you see. It, it was phenomenal. When you see those star trails, the reality sets in that we are the ones spinning around, not the stars. That's just so cool. It really blows my mind even to this day. A couple of years later, I met someone who had actually worked in Whistler and I'd never heard of the place. Not a skier, not a snowboarder or anything like that. But I thought, hey, let's go there and check it out. And so I got a job uh, with one of the local photographers. Being up on the mountains, looking at everything every day, that was a game changer. A couple of years later, an opportunity came up to work for Whistler Blacker in the grooming department. Just seeing the environment at night is just a whole different other level.
it's amazing to take a photograph, but there are times where I just enjoy the beauty that's around me. It's so quiet and peaceful and it really puts it into perspective. So that's when it started. And I think the first week of the first year, we, we went up to the Crystal Hut for a fondue dinner. And they were like, this is how uh, you're gonna get to and from the restaurant tonight. It was just the best time ever. I must have spent 10 minutes inside and the rest was outside taking photos. I just thought it was beautiful. A couple of years later, they offered me a job as a chef. You know, I do have a hard time explaining to a lot of my friends what it is I do for a job. And they're like, oh, you're a cook. And it's like, well, yeah, but my restaurant's at 6,000 feet up a mountain. It's not quite an average job. Every single person that comes on our tour has a different background. And everyone comes to Whistler for different reasons and it's, it's really cool when you take the time to, to learn why people are here and learn all their stories. Getting to share my experience with guests is fantastic. A lot of people live in big cities, they can't see the stars, they can't see the environment doing its thing. They get to experience these things that are normal to us, but it's not normal to everyone else. We're here year in, year out. These guests come here for a week, a month, whatever it is, and it's a, it's a beautiful environment we get to live in. Hopefully they can take something like that home with them. I would definitely recommend is getting all of that done when you get into Canada in the first couple of days. In most parts of Canada they'll always ask you for two forms of identification so just remember to bring those two. All employers will ask you for your social insurance number, they'll also ask you for your passport and they'll ask you for your payroll information. You should probably sort out your banking pretty quickly. What I would recommend is finding out what banks exist in Whistler. Off the top of my head, and there's one called Blue Something. All of those ones exist in Whistler, but make sure that there is one here before you sign up to a bank, because the problem being, it's not like in the UK. If you try and use your card here, um, that, and it's from a different bank, then they'll charge you at least $3 for using that ATM. So you don't want to be doing that regularly. I cannot tell you how frustrating it is living in Canada without a credit card. It's not like the UK where you don't really need one to get on, but here a lot of the times companies will not take your reservations or they will not accept what your information is without your credit card. So it really does help having a credit card here. Those are my top tips for living in Whistler. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, pop them in the comments. I'll be posting a few more videos over the next few days. So if you would like to listen to those, you can either subscribe to be notified or you can just check back later and see a few of those as they come out. Uh, no matter what you do though, I hope this has been really helpful for you and I'll see you around in Whistler, hopefully.
It's a disaster, man.
Where's the hole here? Crusted. Oh. Woo. I get my bearings here. Alright, this is stagger home from this entrance here instead of the chute entrance. Whoa! Wow, it's really wind blowing in here. I gotta get down there. I don't want to go that way. So, just crack this down. Whoa! It's always so full of rocks, man. Oh, he's gone. Oh, nice. Ooh. Oh, fuck. Oh, big fucking shark there. Woo! Woohoo! Whoa, here it comes. Oh, that was a mega shark. All right, we're gonna go check out exhilaration again here. Man. A lot has changed here again since last week. Who? Is that a rock? That's a rock. Just gotta get to there and stop. That's an edge. Right. Oh, yeah. Hoo hoo. Frig. All right. All right. Well, it took me a few tries. Little things that can make a wood feel so special, so loved, and so adored, and you do that. You can make me feel adored. You do it when you want to. What about me? Oh, yeah, I know, I know I have my moments too. When I can get on your nerves, uh -huh. But I want you to realize that taking care of the home, the kids, working every day, that can start to wear anybody down. So when you come home at night, maybe it's not lingerie and champagne like it used to be. But you know what's there? That same old heart, the one that beats for you, baby.
Oh man, I am not sure about this at all. I'm a bit nervous. <sighs> this is full of snow, that's for sure. I'm going to go slow. I'll just watch it funnel out. It's holding good. Oh, rocks! Oh, fuck. My poor skis. Well, I don't even know if that was worth it, but whatever. Oh, I can't see good enough this time. Screw it. Come on, son. Waiting for the viz a bit. I know what's here. I did it already. So, just... Now I'm in. Should be able to see pretty good though. Oh, look at that entrance. That's still sketch. Just waiting for a bit more light. Alright, there's lots of rocks to see from. Okay, so this time ski it. Frick, that is steep, man. Ooh. Ooh.
to a ridge runner. Ridge runner. gonna go down this time. How about short horn?
All right, guys, what's up? It's me, Andreas, and today it's just a quick one. Me and Chris have decided to hike up all the way to the top of Harmony, and because it's not open yet, we are going to try to come down the backside into what hopefully is a nice powder field that doesn't have too many tracks through it yet. So, uh, yeah, gotta, gotta get the pace going because it is golden hour and the sun is setting and we don't want to miss the sunset.
It took a lot of people investing and working hard and, and believing in, in this place being a winner, and it is. There's that classic picture of Franz Wilhelmsen standing on the top of a rock, kind of pointing at where he wants to put the next run. People around here are constantly looking for action and, and what's next. Don't wait. Let's get out there and do it. It was really a place that had just raw energy. Everybody was a dreamer. If I wasn't a dreamer, I wouldn't come here. The verve for life, I think, is what gets into anybody's blood and soul and keeps them here. There's mountains that are better and there are towns that are better, but there isn't a town-mountain combination like Whistler anywhere in the universe, and that's why you have to live here. Whistler is it's this magical place, and it is what you want it to be. It's what shaped me and made me who I am today. You're nobody unless you come here and prove it. There are so many incredible personalities that have come together and, and being active and being healthy and, you know, making that a priority over work. People really cared about which of the best two mountains in North America was better than the other one, right? <laughs> Pretty awesome. Whistler, as it's now known, started in 1960 when a group of Vancouver businessmen, led by Franz Willemsen, ventured north on a mission to find a mountain suitable for hosting the Winter Olympics. After four hours on logging roads, they made it to a sleepy fishing camp known as Alta Lake and spotted what they were looking for. Although the mountain and snowfall were impressive, the idea of hosting a Winter Olympics there in less than a decade was certainly met with some skepticism. The, the 68 bid was preposterous. It was not believable. The Olympics are always based on dreams, and typically, they're not very realistic. Olympics happen in Europe, man. <laughs> they all happen in North America, in Canada, Vancouver. There was nothing here. We'd have to go to Squamish to do our, our groceries. There was no bank. It was pretty rugged. Mid-60s, late-60s even, it was still a gravel road, three, four hours of driving. But the spirit was there. The spirit for the Olympics was born very early. Though the bid failed in 1964, the group pushed on, and in January 1966, the list started turning on Whistler Mountain. There were six trails on Whistler, and none of them had been cleared properly. If you couldn't ski moguls, you couldn't ski because there was nothing else but moguls. 
We have stories about the first year where people come up and they have never skied before. They came up and take one look at the gondola and, uh, and the trails coming down and they turn around back home again. It was an adventure. But everybody was up here to see what this place could give you. Whistler quickly earned a reputation for big vertical and deep powder snow. And it wasn't long before the ski bums arrived. Well, everybody was a ski bum because this place wouldn't pay anybody enough to live here. Back in those days, I think Dag Abbey was the best. He was just a phenomenal skier. I remember watching him jumping off the cornice up in the glacier here, and he just landed and went straight down, just one track. I could still see that. <laughs> oh, he was fabulous. While Dag Abbey was the talk of the valley for the impressive lines he was pioneering both on and off Whistler Mountain, in 1968, another bold skier arrived, took over the ski school program, and helped to vault Whistler onto the international stage. Jim McConkie has a wide reputation as a high mountain and glacier skier. I got the helicopter skiing going here. I thought this was a good publicity for Whistler because people could come and on a nice day, they could get in the helicopter and go ski the glaciers.
Alright, stop, collaborate and listen. Ice is back with a brand new invention. Something wraps a hold of me tightly. Cold like a harpoon daily and nightly. Will it ever stop, yo? I don't know. Turn off the lights, huh? And I'll glow. To the extreme, I rock a mic like a vandal. Line up a stage and whack a chump like a candle. Dance, rock the speaker that booms. I'm killing your brain like a poisonous mushroom. Dead. Word spread quickly that Whistler was the place to go for adventurous skiers. But with big alpine terrain, also came big avalanche risk. Not wanting to tighten the ropes like the resorts in the US, and with no other precedent to follow, a group of Whistler ski patrollers led by mountain manager and tireless visionary, Hugh Smythe, looked for other solutions. A lot of the stuff was done purely on initiative and creativity. Hugh was the guy that started throwing bombs out of the helicopter. It was pioneering in, you know, in all aspects. The first bomb you throw, that's it, it's heroin. You're, you're addicted. Then they brought in avalanche guns later on. The avalanche gun that was just getting formulated from being a, a baseball thrower when we were practicing shooting Campbell soup tins until we could figure it all out and let us play with the real stuff, you know, with the live ammo. With the counterculture movement sweeping its way across North America in the late 60s and early 70s, it wasn't long before Whistler established itself as the unofficial cap. Then you had, I, I, I call them the ski bums, the ones who were the UIC ski team. Some fabulous skiers here at the time, people like Byron Gracie, Rene Paquette. Well, I think most of these guys were on unemployment insurance. And there was a lot of hippies there in those days. <laughs> but they were harmless, they didn't. It didn't bother anybody. It was a real mess. You can't believe how messy it was. It was hippie time. Smoking pot was more important than working. And, and you're riding up on the chairlift, you could smell the marijuana from the guys up in the chairs in front of you. <laughs> One of my jobs was to try and make sure that everybody had a lift ticket. And I had difficulty getting staff in those days because they all just wanted to ski and lots of parties. The ski bums and the hippies weren't the only thing challenging the management in the early days. Success brought a new set of problems. Whistler became so popular that there'd be lineups almost to the gas station there. But I remember one year, Franz came up with the idea that if, if you hike to mid-terminal, you ski for free. And I said to Franz, Franz, do you know what you're, there's gonna be a, a lot of people do that, they'll hike up. No, nobody's gonna hike up there. And it was just like the Chilkoot Pass. It was just a steady line of people going up, so they had to stop it. <laughs> the eclectic culture of the time manifested itself perfectly in the burgeoning sport of freestyle skiing. It was just a bunch of guys that, free spirits, just wanted to ski together and have a great time. And certainly the, the social aspect was a big part of it because... The different types of people who ski are a show in themselves. Enjoy your own aspects of skiing. There's an exciting rush that always comes. And that should never become routine. Whether it was the hot doggers, racers, or just plain old snow lovers, Whistler was on the map. 
Established as a year-round resort, it was one of the few places in the world where as much skiing progression happened in the summer as in the winter. By the mid-1970s, a few cracks started to show in Franz Willemsen's dream. Whistler had once again failed on their attempts to host both the 1976 and 1980 Olympics. Hugh Smythe left town, and unbridled development threatened the future of the resort. That's when Al Rain and his wife Nancy Green stepped in with a vision to transform the town's garbage dump into a world-class European-style ski village. There was Al Rain, brilliant guy with a a head that could bring structure to deliver what needed to be done. The visionary behind Whistler Village. The village opened in 1980, and at the same time, Hugh Smythe made his return to Whistler, this time at the helm of the new resort across the country. When I play a book, melody, anything less than the best is a felony. Love it or leave it, you better gain weight. You better hit a fool's out of kids, don't play. If there was a problem, yo, I'll solve it. Check out the hook while my DJ revolves it. Come on now. 
I'm just fucking real, man. I don't know what the fuck you call it, man. This is fucking killer. <laughs> Nice job, buddy. Fucking right. Holy shit, man. The Valley called Black Home. I'll tell you, there's some tense moments in this place. Franz, he had vision for Whistler Mountain, but he had absolutely no vision at all for Blackcomb. He, 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 he thought it would never happen. Hugh, when he came in, it was just such a dynamic change, and so it happened so quickly. While the village and Blackcomb were impressive, it seemed the timing of their completion could not have been worse. When Blackcomb was first built, the 80-81 season, we had a horrendous year. It was very, very warm. There was no snow on the mountain. So you can imagine after spending, you know, three years dreaming, designing, building, and whatever in your very first year out of the box, you have to shut her down. By 1982, the, the wheels came off. The economy went in the tank, interest rates went to 23%, and Whistler Village was in dire straits. As I always say, last person leaving Whistler, please turn out the lights. That's how bad it was. Thankfully, it was a group of fearless Canadian ski racers known as the Crazy Canucks who arrived in Whistler for the World Cup downhill, just when the town and Canadian skiing needed them most. The whole town turned out, they were trying to get Dave Murray down the hill and Dave Irwin, myself, and so there was this whole community effort. We ran the race at Glacier World Cup. Dave came third, I came second. We rolled in the middle of town and the place was just full of people. And, uh, that was the closest I ever got to being a rock star. I walked out on the stage and said, you know, you know, you wrestle, you rock. And I was like, roar! It was really an epic day for, for me. I think it was uh, in, in sport in Canada, it was pretty, pretty intense. And for Whistler, it was fun. The following season, the snow returned. And shortly after, the economy came with it. Whistler was back on track. But for Franz Willemsen and the management at Whistler Mountain, their toughest battle yet had just begun. Competing against Hugh was just really tough. Competition between the two mountains was just absolutely fabulous because when Blackham and Whistler started to compete with each other, their service level. <laughs> we didn't have the terrain, we didn't have the number of lifts, and we didn't have 15 years of history. Um, so we had to use every tool that we could come up with. Hugh's serving coffee in the lineup, and then he's serving lemonade, and then he's serving something else. What would make a difference? Let's go out and, you know, at the end of the day and sweep everybody's windshield. We would brainstorm and come up with ideas that either we invent. So I guess, go look at the signs up Blackcomb, take a photo, let's see what we can do. Oh, just Blackcomb, we don't want to do this. Just go and do it. Why not? It's working. You know, just do it. I mean, we'd have binoculars out of the office kind of looking, okay, they've got a lineup over there. Like, oh, okay, how many, you know, how are they doing? How busy is it? I'd see the cars going by, going to black call. I'd be on the ground trying to figure out our parking, and Hugh is flying around in the helicopter organizing parking. Hugh doesn't sleep. Uh, we, we're convinced that if he's sleeping, he's thinking of sleep. You know, it was, it was tenacious. He's unmatched. He really is unmatched. They were playing chess and we were playing checkers. It was that simple. The battle for mountain supremacy wasn't only being waged in the boardrooms. Once Blackcomb opened here, people really took sides right away. You were either a Whistler skier or you were a Blackcomb skier. Whistler. I'm a Whistler girl. Dark side, Blackcomb. Blackcomb's my mountain. Blackcomb. Yeah, we called it Cloudcomb. Yeah, we never wanted to go over there. <laughs> It was on the dark side. I was a black home guy, for sure. I, I, to me, black home represented the future, represented where skiing was heading, and, and Whistler was kind of like where skiing was. Black home all seemed a little more instant, 
corporate, and even the runs, like if I want to get right down to, you know, the way they cut the runs straight down the front. It just looked like a barcode to me. We were ski racing, we had the Whistler Mountain Ski Club, we had a long history of various races. Meanwhile, thing, and who thought that was gonna last? They hated us. They're the
to spit at us on the chair. And so it's like, f those guys. Black home was everything. Whistler didn't even exist to us. Like, when I had my shop, it was the snowboard shop Black home. We couldn't have cared less about Whistler. It was weird if you, like, dated a kid from the Black home ski club when you skied for Whistler. <laughs> I don't think I skied on Black home in the first eight years it was here. Seems crazy, but <laughs> I was busy. Whistler had lots to offer. After four years of battling toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hugh and Blackcomb, Franz Willemsen had finally had enough and chose to retire. The following year, Hugh Smythe pulled off his most outrageous move yet. Five. He, I think, got it from Alberta. Hugh Smythe went to Fortress and stole the tea bar in the middle of the night and moved it over to 7-7, Seven -Seven, what is now 7-7. Seven -Seven. Regardless of how that T-bar was acquired, it certainly raised the ante in the battle of Whistler versus Blackcomb. Blackcomb would act and Whistler would react, eventually creating one of the most advanced ski lift systems in the world. And it wasn't just mountain operations where Blackcomb was pushing. The marketing department was equally aggressive. In the 80s, it was kind of a place where anything went. It was a very in-your-face, have fun, youthful culture, and it was working for us. It was the place that, that the film crews would come and, and, and do stuff in. It was where Eric Peota and, and Trevor Peterson were kind of pioneering lines off in the spearhead. I mean, it was the place where the front edge of skiing was, was moving forward. And for me, it really got driven home when Greg Stump's crew pulled into town to film License to Thrill. Glenn Flake, Scott Schmidt. I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. Around that same time, there was a new sport starting to catch on. And while it was banned at Whistler Mountain, Blackcomb's doors were wide open. As usual, it comes down to money. It's like, you know, Blackcomb was hungry. They select the progression of snowboarding. All the top pros would show up, and now it's just this little grom. And it was just like mind-boggling. People were doing the craziest stuff I'd ever seen. Snowboarding pioneers like Craig Kelly, Sean Johnson, and Terry A. Hawkinson were regulars on Blackcomb. But no. Yeah, they started modern snowboarding. I mean, people hucking huge off cliffs. That's Damien. He says, I'd drive from California for one hit on the windlet. While most would agree that Damien was the king of the Blackcomb windlet, during one of those sessions, it was a Blackcomb local named Doug Lundgren who would also stamp his name into snowboarding legend. Him and Damien were going all day just back and forth, who was going bigger, who was going bigger. And, you know, before you know it, it's, it's the jump off on the windlet. And I still think probably the best photo ever in snowboarding. It's Doug just hanging in space, and you can see Alex Warburton in the bottom corner just going. Meanwhile, over on Whistler, the locals were steadfast with their support for the mountain, and ski racing dominated the scene. Good on February 25th, 1989, a courageous young downhiller who grew up in a cabin under the Creekside Gondola did something that no Canadian had ever done before. Yes! Oh, yes! Unbelievable! Unbelievable! Broad boy for the sensational run! It didn't really matter what side of the Whistler Blackcomb debate you were on. When Rob Boyd won that downhill, it, it really unified the community and, and everyone was behind it. I mean, every person in this town will tell you exactly where they were and what they were doing when they heard Rob won that downhill. One of the most amazing moments in Whistler's history, for sure. A local
was packed. Dave Murray being chairman of that race, everybody was just so proud. My mom said, Rob, you got stubble on your face, but like this. <laughs> 
come on, you gotta shave it before you get on the podium. So she hauled me back to the house, which is right across the creek from the finish area. Scraped my chin down and went back out for the awards. <laughs> It was, I think even the Europeans were happy to see Rob win. You know, I think it was one of those moments where you just felt good. You had a feeling throughout the entire village. Rob Boyd had won the race, as well as the hearts of Whistler locals and Canadians alike. But Hugh Smythe and Blackcomb were winning the resort battle. After teaming up with Joe Hussein and his company Intrawest, Blackcomb was unstoppable. And in 1996, the inevitable finally happened. Well, I think everyone around here was, was pretty nervous when the merge happened. I mean, Whistler and Blackcomb competing against each other, you know, led to all this progression. I remember they brought us all into Lapray, the little restaurant, and told us that it was, uh, that this was going on, and I, we cried. It seemed like we were gonna lose something. To a large degree, if you'd really thought about it, any time looking down the, the the tube, you could see it coming. Suddenly, we were introduced to this whole other group of people that were living this parallel life. Once that door was removed, then it was pretty cool. Fortunately, when Whistler and Blackcomb came together, they actually just fed off each other and got stronger. And, and I think, you know, there's a lot of sighs of relief breathes in the year or two after that, that, hey, this place, you know, probably just got better. I kept always thinking, gosh, Whistler has a lot of great stuff. How come I didn't come here earlier? This time, the timing could not have been better. With the economy booming and the interest in snow sports on the rise, the newly formed Whistler Black Home soon found itself rated as the number one resort in North America. It was the perfect place for a group of young skiers known as the New Canadian Air Force to inject some much needed energy back into the aging sport of skiing. Creating twin tip skis so they could go backwards like a snowboard could in the, in the half pipe in the terrain park. I mean, it was incredible. In the late 90s, literally every week something got done up there for the first time. And that was, that was really a, a huge driver in the, in the progression of the sport. Once snowboarders started getting their ass kicked on going big by skiers, you know, they'd step it up and they'd step it up. And, it, it, it's hard to even describe how much of an influence that is on the entire ski and snowboard world. Rather than focusing on each other, a united Whistler Black Home was taking on the world. More progression was happening at the World Ski and Snowboard Festival in April than most resorts would see in an entire season. In 1998, Ross Rebliati brought home the first Olympic gold medal for snowboarding, and with that, long dormant dream was reignited. Standing in Mountain Square, the morning of July 2nd, 2003, it was exciting, it was electric, but there was some anxiety. When Rogue hesitated for what felt to me like a full minute, you could have heard a pin drop. My, my heart was in my mouth. The International Olympic Committee has the honor of announcing that the 21st Olympic Winter Games in 2010 are awarded to the city of Vancouver. In 2003, when the announcement came, there was, there was a lot of people cheering and absolutely thrilled that we were finally getting the Olympics about time and a whole another party that was saying, no, we don't need it. Worcester's already big enough. We're on the map. Thanks very much. We don't need the Olympics. Like, no, 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 not now. I was kind of scared at first, not so much about the games, but about all the years leading up to the games. As the Olympics approached, anxieties melted away, and more and more people got behind the dream, a dream launched by the founding fathers more than 40 years ago. With the game secure, Hugh Smythe set in motion what would be his final and most audacious plan of his career. Vision. I think that's what Hugh is, is really in a league all his own, is he has a vision that who else would have thought of a peak to peak? <laughs> And 
number you have called is disconnected.
Wrapping it up for the day. Another day, another dollar. <laughs> another day, another no dollar. <laughs> Everyone in town was kind of like confused, like how are you gonna link the mountains up near the tops? I mean, the, the, the gap, the Fitzsimmons Valley just seemed way too big. And then all of a sudden they showed the plans and you're like, oh my God, they're actually gonna put a tower over here on Whistler and a tower over here on Blackcomb and it's actually gonna cross the whole span. And, and that at the time I remember thinking like, well, that's a pretty bold move. And there was a lot of people in town that were skeptical. It was tough sledding. There was, there was a lot of strong opposition inside our own company too. And rightfully so. With a price tag of over $50 million, the peak to peak seemed like insanity to many in the community. And opponents let Hugh know exactly what they thought. With this harebrained idea, if you're going to spend that much money, why don't you build a whole bunch of lifts and whatever and go, well, you know, we, we, this is this is something that's going to change the, the face of Whistler, from, you know, winter, summer. Despite several major setbacks, including the sale of IntraWest and the economic meltdown, the Peak to Peak opened in style on December 12th, 2008. I was on the car when my son Shane did the jump off it. Mr. Blackhole, opening day, let's have some fun. Five. Four, they climbed up three. on the roof and they bailed off. Just say, see ya, and away they go. <laughs> it's just a transportation system, it's a ride. And when you got to see the looks on people's faces that, you know, maybe even their first time in the mountains as they crossed that, it became very, very clear that the Peak to Peak was a winner. I mean, it, it has really revolutionized not only the way that you use the mountains in the winter, but the whole experience year round here. And the naysayers, I mean, have come up and told me to my face, said, you know what, you were, you, you know, you, this, this works. The peak to peak set three world records for cable lifts the day it opened. But more importantly, it gave Whistler something to show off when the world arrived in 2010. When it really hit home is when, when the, the torch came into town. Of course, the dream comes through. You couldn't not get caught up in it. I remember walking through the village and there was all these bands playing and like people with it. It gave us a sense of pride, you know? It, it's like, all right, we pulled it off. You know, this place was born from an Olympic dream. And to actually see that dream realized after all those years was, was pretty special. Look at us. Look at what this town can do. So many good people stepped up and worked so hard and slept so little for those two weeks. You'd think, wow, this was designed for this. You know, the city fathers that conceived the idea and Al Rain and others, I think that was a crowning, a crowning moment. Though the Olympic dream eventually came true, it's unlikely any of the original pioneers could have imagined what Whistler would become in just 50 years. Did they foresee a place where the lifts would turn all year round? Where people would work every day all winter so they could ride every day all summer? And where the biggest event of the year would be witnessed by fans wearing shorts and t-shirts rather than ski jackets? Probably not. There's no doubt that progress has changed these mountains and this valley turns as strong as it ever has. You'll find it in the skiers, the snowboarders, Olympians and entrepreneurs, artists, musicians, mountain bikers, and trail runners, and anyone who's ever chased a dream. I'm probably more excited today than I was when I was 20. Just when you think that the progression has gone so far already and you're like you wonder what's going to be next. There's always the one that go one step further because that's their nature. Oh gosh, it blows my mind. It really does. I feel like that's what Whistler has done to the younger generation is offered them opportunity to push themselves. 
you see all these influences just take over the world and it's just like, yeah, that's Whistler.
check. Growing up here is, is going to be just as special today as it was 30, 40, we're now up to the fourth generation 50 years ago. So I think, I think the future is extremely bright.
attraction. It's that gentle tug at your sleeve, a siren call, drawing on our desires to dig deeper, climb higher, and roam further. In the heart of British Columbia's coast mountains, that same invisible force urges unsuspecting snow revelers towards its epicenter. Drawn to imagination, drawn to challenge, drawn to possibilities. Now firmly in winter's unshakable grasp, these proud patrons of powder will happily journey to the ends of the earth in pursuit of a single snowflake, a quest for a fabled ski line, the perfect turn, or that one elusive shot. Or they could just go skiing at home. First chair. All right, boys, just getting to the top. How you guys looking? Cameras ready? What possibilities await a pilot with countless hours of flight time? He has skied this mountain 1,000 times before, yet it never feels the same. An abundance of options await below. Yep, all cameras recording. He adjusts his equipment for optimal performance, then scans the terrain to survey his options. Yep, copy. Dropping it down. Patiently waiting for the perfect moment. Hey, look at me! I'm trying to drop here! Come on! Oh, sorry, sorry, Stan. Do your thing.
Hey everyone, today's headline, Fiverr anyone? Here's the picker. The Whistler weather story is now back to weak storms in dry northwest flow, giving a fiver or two. Yeah. But turning cold Sunday and frigid Monday and the winds 40 gusting 60 are making it cold enough already today up top. The subtle image shows a wave west of Heideglide topping the ridge and angling for Whistler. By this afternoon, it's moving on to the central coast, and by tomorrow, it's blown through Whistler after depositing a fiver or two. But the Cascades is where city hounds want to be tomorrow. Here's why. In northwest flow, northwest-facing slopes force the air upslope, boosting vertical motion in the storm, and most importantly, the precip rate and quantity. Precip patterns follow the terrain, and the 12-hour forecast makes that blindingly obvious on the northwest-facing slopes of the Cascades. Note that Sasquatch Resort near Harrison Hot Springs on the other side of the valley suffers from downslope flow in this pattern, hence next to nothing for precip. This is the same process that makes Kamloops so dry year-round. Back to Whistler. Saturday it's the same old, same old, and Monday and Tuesday's pattern gets even drier. Cheers, and I'll see you at Manning Park tomorrow. collide in a violent tempest. Feathery crystals fall from an ashen sky with hypnotic fealty. The squall wraps the mountain in a cold embrace, but the sensation is anything but cold. Against all primal instincts, revelers cast themselves headlong into the eye of the storm, powerless to resist its mysterious lure. Yes. How's that? Was maybe the turn of a lifetime. That was insane. Mama, don't be so scared. Everyone wanna be so high.
It's what you carry within Mama, don't be so scared Mama, 